Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Edge reporting from Southern India. I wanted to resume a uh, series of videos that had been started um, on Hindu philosophy, and I wanted to continue today. That's why it's talking about a particular god, um, as philosophy was just on Shiva rather than a particular classic text. But uh, this video, I'll be talking about two classic texts of Hindu philosophy, uh, one from the ancient era, that is the Ramayana, the ancient Sanskrit epic, and the other one, the more recent, from about 500 years ago, um, him, the Hanuman Shalisa, which was composed in a sort of archaic dialect of Hindi. And this video will be focusing on a particular um, figure that is the, the monkey god Hanuman, but it will be following along with those classic texts. Now, I just wanted to show you some of what's coming up this week. I will be um, resuming the Ted Kaczynski series by talking about anti-tech revolution. That will be coming up tomorrow morning in due time. And uh, also the philosophy of John Michael Greer, something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but uh, finally getting around to it. And uh, this video will focus on, uh, once again, the Hanuman Chavisa and the Ramayana of Hindu philosophy. So once again, Hanuman is the monkey god, which gives him a somewhat ambiguous um, position with regard to the gods and with regard to humans. And a lot of the interesting uh, relation that he will have to, say, the Ramayana or the Mahabharata is um, these are stories which largely deal with uh, the realm of human problems, and yet Hanuman as a monkey is going to be caught up in, say, the battle uh, within the family in Mahabharata, in, in some level he's involved there. And he's going to be involved with the drama of um, a, uh, a, a wife unjustly kidnapped and taken to a foreign land, which uh, I kind of like the story of Helen and Troy in um, a Hindu context in the Ramayana. And yet, as somebody who is also a monkey, he's going to teach us, ironically enough, something about us as humans. And some of the background context of the Ramayana that I want to talk about before we get started on a more, um, more in-depth look at the text itself is that, you know, the Ramayana is not really one book so much as it is a story which has, even at the epic level, some variation um, with regard to uh, the different forms we have. So the Ramayana reached what might be considered like its final form as an ancient Sanskrit epic about 2,000 years ago. And in this era of ancient Sanskrit epics of, say, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and I know that I'm not pronouncing these words exactly right, sorry, as a, a non-Sanskrit speaker, you can go to uh, Flowers Your Love Sons channel or have Shivam, who lives there in Delhi, give you the proper pronunciation as a native speaker of Hindi. But I will still do my best to try to talk about these concepts, even with a very imperfect pronunciation. So the era of ancient Sanskrit epics um, gives you it, it coincides with this birth of Puranic Hinduism. And Puranic Hinduism comes from, you know, the um, Sanskrit and also in Hindi, the word for the past, which is uh, coincidentally enough the same uh, word for ghost in Hindi and um, Sanskrit. Uh, the word, I guess, but, uh, from which we get then Puranic for the ancient type of Hinduism, is actually the idea that if you see a ghost, you see, you're seeing the past, I guess, you're seeing somebody who was the past, but is still here in the present. And that's a really interesting sort of etymological way of looking at it. But Puranic or ancient Hinduism that you have with this recognizable form of epics um, is after the Vedic era of Hinduism. So some historians will say that the earliest era of Hinduism goes all the way back to the Indus Valley civilization. And <laughs> excuse me, there's very little evidence about that in comparison with say the body of literature that we have extant from the era of Vedic Hinduism, in which we have um, this body of literature, but it's remarkably different from the kind of literature that you have with, say, the, the epics of the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, Mahabharata, actually, I think, the, the world's longest poem that's ever been written. So we have these big epics which deal with um, uh, characters, and they deal with human drama in the sense of, you know, the Mahabharata is 
the um, you know brother will kill brother basically it's a it's a fight within a family over a piece of land and the Ramayana is the human problem of a man kidnapping a woman's wife and then the army is summoned to go over and reclaim her which is kind of like the Iliad um, but the Vedic Hinduism is not like that the literature um, the 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 body of knowledge I should say that survives more consists of things like chants things like melodies, and these are really rituals for the elite priesthood. And the understanding of God at this time, or the gods, or the divine, is a lot more abstract as well. It's more the idea of a personification of nature, in the sense you have the, um, the divine god of thunder, god of fire, Soma is the moon. And Vishnu sort of exists in this Vedic universe of, um, of, of natural gods, but he has a fairly small role within it in the Vedic um, literature. But with Quranic Hinduism, you have, instead of this archaic or arcane knowledge for the priesthood and the elites, you have instead a method of communication which is accessible to the masses. And you have an understanding of God, which comes a lot closer to um, the immediately accessible, the intuitively accessible, because here you have the rise of the personal gods who have um, uh, this wealth of myths, which are very memorable about them. For example, all of the myths about Shiva, God of destruction, who's a pretty interesting and memorable character. In fact, I see his, um, his face on the street in India every day. He's a very recognizable guy and he's an interesting personality, um, dwelling in meditation, uh, ash smeared hair, um, you know, and of course, who can forget the phallic symbols of Shiva? And of course, you have Sh uh, excuse me, Vishnu also, who is not the god of destruction like Shiva, but the god of preservation. And he comes to have these avatars, um, figures on the earth who um, embody Vishnu, the god, like Ram in the Ramayana and Krishna in the Mahabharata. And of course, you have Lord Brahma, who's an interesting character as well, a god of creation, who, um, for example, creates the um, the creation, but messes up by only creating the masculine half. So he goes back to supplement the lack of femininity by creating a woman. But of course, he falls in love with his own creation. And in one form of, of the myth, she uh, responds to that by fleeing from him in the form of a cow. She transforms into a cow. And he responds to that by taking the form of a bull, which is compatible with a cow. And then uh, let me just make sure that this is true. Uh, response to that by fleeing from him before Okay, so it looks like it is working. I just had to check because I am in a village where internet is always not always reliable. So in one form, and then she becomes a doe, so he becomes a buck, and then she becomes a mare, and he becomes a stallion, as I mentioned in the last video. And uh, Lord Brahma, whatever you might think about him, is a very interesting character. And this is Puranic Hinduism, in which now you have these big epics and you have a way of communication which the masses can understand. And in the Ramayana, you have this emphasis of characters over the abstraction of Vedic ideas, but it's still a text about the Vedic ideas, okay? And in a lot of ways, it's a text about how different characters will respond to having this Vedic knowledge, which was once considered exclusive. It was, it was once considered this um, esoteric knowledge of the priesthood, right? And Dharma is gonna be a concept which doesn't have one single translation into English, but one context of Dharma in the Ramayana is something like the Western concept of the ethics. And and whereas for, say, Aristotle, ethics means embodying the virtues of a human being in the sense that uh, a knife has certain virtues. And a knife is a good knife, uh, not a moral knife necessarily, but it's a good knife if it's sharp, if it fits in your hand, if it can chop vegetables, whatever. And humans have those virtues too. And um, in the Vramiana, Dharma is a little more like doing your social role. And it means doing it even when injustice happens to you. For example, Ram is unjustly banished from his own kingdom, um, but he accepts it rather than becomes bitter about it. And interesting thing is that you might ordinarily think, as the ancient Greeks would, that uh, the, uh, the humans are necessarily above the animals because the ancient Greek concept is that animals lack logos and humans are the animal with logos. So there's just kind of this categorical um, elevation of humans above animals. But in the Ramayana, it's more complicated than that because um, Ravana, the villain, is obviously not a monkey himself as Hanuman is. 
And yet, as a person, he has a choice either to rise up to an ethical standard above animals by using this Vedic knowledge to realize that the purpose is to transcend your own spiritual defects, which is what Ram understands. Um, but Ravana has the other choice, to abuse the Vedic knowledge in order to try to manipulate others for selfish gain and therefore to use it as a means to get power. And this shows that um, the monkey is not the lowest on the chain of ethics. It's actually that um, if you understand ethics to be consciousness of other people's needs, um, then the kind of territoriality which humans exhibit, um, when they ignore that, uh, consciousness of other people's needs actually makes us even worse than monkeys, and that's going to be a big theme here. So I want to give a little more background on the characters and the setting of, of the epic. And the epic is set in India, obviously, and there's this talk of the northern kingdom, which is kind of like here, which we call um, Ayodhya, which is kind of like, uh, I guess, right around here, a uh, region where uh, Shivam is from and where I've been before. And then uh, there's the land in between, which is, which is Kishkinda, which is the land of the Vanara, or the monkeys. This is Hanuman's region, basically, uh, which is, uh, I guess, right around here, where I live right now. And then, of course, there's uh, Lanka, which is the side I went here, where actually I've been there too, which is uh, um, the land of Rakshana. These are the barbarians who neglect Dharma. And Ravana, the villain, this is his land. Okay, so you have Ram, Hanuman, and Ravana. And you have to keep in mind that um, speaking about north and south is figurative. It's not the literal um, designation of the north and the south. It's kind of like Plato's notion that reason is higher up than the lower appetites. And you kind of model a society in Plato's Republic with the philosopher king at the top, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a little bit like that with the difference that once again, monkeys are not at the bottom because humans who abuse their power are even lower than monkeys. And let's speak a bit more about the characters. Ram is Vishnu's avatar, and he's unjustly banished by his father when one of his father's wives, you know, forces him to um, to uh, to banish Ram. And Ram's father, um, of course, is not happy about this, but he sort of does what he has to, and Ram also does what he has to, but he doesn't feel any bitterness about it. And Hanuman is actually Shiva's form. We normally talk about the avatars of Vishnu, like Ram and uh, Krishna. But in a certain sense, Shiva also has these manifestations, and Hanuman is one of them. And there are many um, sort of philosophical uh, correlations between Hanuman and Shiva. And of course, there's Sita, who is... Um, Ram's wife, who is a beautiful woman who is kidnapped by the evil king Ravana and taken uh, to the island of Lanka. And of course, there's Lakshman, who is Ram's brother, but uh, although a great person, still less spiritually advanced than Ram. And of course, then there's um, Ravana. He is an evil king, but he's not somebody who um, lacks any knowledge of, of spiritual um, uh, spiritually valuable Vedic knowledge. In fact, he's the son of a Rishi, and a Rishi in this age was kind of like a sage, or kind of like a hermit, almost, who devote, who was, they might have been, they were married, but they still devote themselves to philosophy. And this is going to be um, uh, the, the question within the Ramayana is, you know, the difference ethically, I guess, and spiritually between here, here, and here. So the story, once again, is a main conflict that uh, Ram's and Ravana, Ram and Ravana respond differently to using the Vedic knowledge, which I mentioned was um, kind of this esoteric knowledge of the priesthood. And um, obviously, um, Ravana is a son of a Vedic hermit, um, somebody who has this um, knowledge of it as knowledge, but he abuses that in order to have power over others by, as you see in this picture, Kinnabit Sita. Um, and of course, Ram is different from that in that he recognizes the purpose is to use it to reach his divine potential. And of course, he can only do that within the constraints of ethical duty in relation to others. Um, but what about the status of Hanuman, the monkey, who's literally from between the two worlds of Ram and Ravana, and also genealogically, basically between worlds. His father is a god and his mother is a female monkey which is rather interesting. And the thing about Hanuman is you'll understand a lot more about him if you know some things about Shiva. Now, the Chalpai uh, number six of the Hanuman Chalisa explicitly links Hanuman to Shiva's manifestation. And the interesting thing here is that although it is customary to speak of 
Vishnu's avatars, there are like Ram and Krishna, there are notable links between um, uh, between um, Shiva and Hanuman. So the th interesting thing about him is, like Shiva, he has a fluidity with regard to things like his form, things like his size, and even things like his language. And Shiva largely embodies this fluidity with regard to form, as the spiritual principle is God of destruction as being not limited by limits, not limited by one particular form, etc. Because Shiva, etymologically speaking, literally means no thing. So you've misunderstood him if you think that he is a thing with a determinate set of limits. Um, and Hanuman uh, demonstrates something like that, but he always um, exercises this fluidity in the narrative in the ethical context of trying to um, be conscious of other people's needs. For example, Hanuman demonstrates evidence of Vedic knowledge in the language of Sanskrit, which is a kind of priestly language. Um, it's not quite a language that is only for scholars, as some people might think, in the sense that there is like an everyday context. Flowers would also mention that like um, uh, practicing a Hindu ritual on a, on a daily basis, you, you have Sanskrit um, heard. It's not only something in a set of books like the, the Latin language is now for much of the um, the Roman Catholic magisterium, but it still is like a priestly uh, language containing this high Vedic knowledge. And it's different from Prakrit, I'm probably mispronouncing that very badly, which is the informal vernacular, which is the everyday spoken language. And Hanuman, although he does demonstrate Vedic knowledge in the language of Sanskrit, he also adjusts his language to speak Prakrit when he meets Sita in Lanka. And that is not just to maybe show off that he has both abilities, it's rather an ethical adjustment to the needs of Sita when he goes to see her in Lanka after she's been kidnapped. And Hanuman also changes his form with a consciousness to her needs in the sense that although he appears as a giant and terrifying monkey when he's in battle, um, he uh, appears as a small and non-scary monkey when he goes to visit Sita because as somebody who is a prisoner in another land, she's already maybe on edge and he goes out of his way to make her more comfortable when he goes to visit her as somebody she doesn't already know. And in Chaopai 8 of Hanuman Shalisa, his mother also tells him stories of his own adventures with Ram when he's a child, which might strike some people as strange in the sense that how could his mother tell him the story of the Ramayana when he's actually going to live it later on, kind of like um, Don Quixote in the later part of part two, Don Quixote, is buying a copy of Don Quixote, which is being printed and you know, remarking like, hmm, I don't know if I remember that part, you know, and it's interesting, like how could Don Quixote read Don Quixote when we're reading the book? And this problem of uh, recursion, which you escape if you no longer posit time as a straight line, and the Nietzschean concept of the eternal return actually does have something of a parallel in the Hinduism in which there is this circularity with regard to time and with regard to events. And uh, um, Hanuman is able to listen to his own, um, listen to the story that he's a part of, but he's not doing it necessarily out of interest about himself. He's listening to it because he's interested in Ram's story. He's interested later on in Krishna's story. He's interested in, um, in Sita's story. And this is another way that Hindus understand ethics in the context of Dharma is being interested in other people's stories because you're interested in their needs. And the reason Bra Lord Brahma is not worshipped, he won't find um, temples of Lord Brahma, is because he's a creator, but he's not somebody who listens to other people's stories. And that is the difference with Hanuman as coming from Shiva. And of course, Hanuman also has a type of formal fluid, fluidity, which he uses in the context of battle in order to win. So Hanuman famously battles several female demons who guard the island of Lanka on his way there to deliver the message to Sita. And one of these is named Simhika, and she is a kind of a sea monster, which he defeats by changing his size. First, he's small enough to be swallowed by the sea monster, and then he becomes large enough to just break out of her digestive system. Then there's another demon named Sarasa, and for her, he expands her jaw when she uh, uh, captures him in her mouth. 
and that forces her to widen her jaw. But then he drops down to the size of a bumblebee and he flies away. And the thing is, he also has a, a formal fluidity, not just with regard to how big he is, but also with regard to what shape he holds. And although he is, in a certain sense, the monkey, um, saying he is a monkey in the sense that he'd be limited to it is not exactly true, because he's oftentimes portrayed with ten heads, one of them a horse, one a lion, one an eagle. And like Shiva, he goes beyond limitation and fixed form, but he always does it for ethical reasons. And of course, the most famous portrayal of Hanuman changing his um, form is the story of the magic herb. So with the help of many monkeys, the story goes that Hanuman built a bridge to Lanka to try to save Sita. But Ram's brother Lakshman in battle was shot by Ravana's son and shot with a poison arrow. So let me just make sure that this is still streaming to Lanka to try to save Sita. But Ram Okay, so it looks like we're good. So um, he, uh, uh, Lakshman, Ram's brother, gets shot by um, a poisonous arrow um, by Vervana's son. So there's an antidote which grows on a distant mountain uh, in the form of an herb. And Hanuman flies to this remote mountain to try to fetch the herb to uh, get it to him in time. But when he gets there, he has to unfortunately fight uh, Kala Nemi, and he wastes a lot of time fighting. And by the time the fight is over, it's actually too dark to just find the herb. So he decides rather than wait till the morning, he can just expand in size, grab the whole mountain, and just carry the mountain back to Lakshman. And this is one of the most famous temple images of Hanuman. The thing about myth is it's impossible really to maybe think about Hanuman in isolation as just a monkey. The way that he's, um, he's uh, portrayed in temple is in events and contexts like this one. And another famous story of Hanuman, uh, kind of equivalent to the ancient Greek story of Icarus, is in Hanuman Chalisa Chaupai 18, we have the story of Hanuman mistaking the sun for a tasty piece of fruit. And he sees the sun, thinks it's a piece of fruit, flies up to eat it, but Indra, the god of the sky, um, notices this and hurls him back down to earth as punishment for his hubris. And Hanuman's jaw is disfigured in the process, and the disfigured jaw becomes a well-known feature, a little bit like Icarus, if you think about it. And in some versions of the story, in his journey to the sun, he treats the celestial bodies up there as toys. He's actually able to maybe move them around. And the thing you gotta understand about Hindu understanding of astrology is that for them, the, um, uh, the study of astrology is the study of this cosmic pattern of destiny. And Hanuman, as somebody who's able to change the location of those celestial bodies, is somebody who can therefore change destiny. And Ravana also is an astrologer who devoted a lot of time to try to understand this. And he wrote a treatise, um, they say, called the Ravana Samhita on astrology. But his interest in astrology was to try to manipulate destiny for his own personal gain. Hanuman must not be understood to, um, to, do, to be doing something like that. Um, he is rather just approaching the stars in order to, to, uh, to engage in play, to you know, kind of just um, have this attitude of playfulness rather than an attitude of domination. Therefore, Hanuman is kind of beyond the arbitrary human meanings in the same way that he's beyond the limitations of form and he's beyond the, um, the layout of the stars that fix destiny. He's also beyond our own human meanings. Child by 19 of the Hanuman Chalisa recounts him placing Ram's ring in his mouth as he leapt over the sea. And you have to understand that in Hinduism, saliva is a contaminant that violates the purity laws. I know from living in India that there are these purity laws about whether somebody can or cannot enter a Hindu temple based on purity. And saliva is considered a contaminant. And Lakshman, in fact, refuses to eat berries that have been taste tested for poison by Shabari because they've been contaminated by saliva. And yet Ram, who's more sophisticated spiritually than Lakshman and more enlightened, has no hesitations about eating the same berries. And that is because Ram and Hanuman are both above the contingent meaning of human values, which are arbitrary. Yet Hanuman maybe goes even further by uh, maybe not placing just berries within his mouth, but he places Ram's precious ring in his mouth. And his common sense view is, well, I needed to carry it someplace safe as I was going to the island of Lanka. And what this shows is the value of jewelry and the value of money in general, the value of gold, is just as contrived as any cultural value 
like whether somebody can you know enter a temple based on saliva contamination. Therefore, the body in Hinduism has to be understood kind of differently than you might normally think. So in, in Hinduism, there's this concept of like animals have the one body, which is the physical body. But humans have three bodies. They have the physical body, the social body, and the psychological body. And this is something which Plato's features actually reached the same conclusion in ancient Greece. And the thing that is easy to misunderstand about his dialogue, the Phaedrus, in which there's this talk of a chariot with two unruly horses, is people might misunderstand and say, yes, that's reason struggling with the passions of the body. And what they miss is that one of the horses is like the physical and the other one's the social because reason is torn by the irrationality of these type of social um, uh, the social body, to put it, you know, exactly the way it should be stated, which is kind of pre-rational. We really have a lot of overlap, as Jordan Peterson notes, with lobsters, as I'll talk about 12 Rules for Life soon. And um, the idea is you have a physical birth, obviously, but that's your physical body. You can have a birth in your psychological body as well. And psychological birth in Hinduism is when you have a guru um, take you on and reveal the Vedic secrets to you. And Ravana, however, missed the whole point of the Vedas, which is not instrumental manipulations of others in order to fill one's own hunger. This is a big theme in Hinduism. It's like you, everyone realizes that they have hunger and fear. But it takes a lot more spiritual uh, sophistication to realize others' hunger and fear. So every animal is aware of their own hunger. But the ethical person is aware of, um, of other people's hunger. And this concept of us, Ma Gyan, um, and I mispronounce it, sorry. Um, self awareness is going to be kind of uh, different from just this consciousness of something as basic as your own hunger. Therefore, the misalignment between thought, action, and speech, the kind of correlates of the three bodies of physical, social, psychological, that's what causes the problems. Yoga is the um, disburdening of mind from hunger, insecurity, and imagination insofar as those cause suffering. Because any animal has hunger, but human imagination radically amplifies the problem of hunger. And this is what makes um, humans lower than monkeys if they abuse it. So Hanuman basically is beyond desire because the desire which comes from insecurity and imagination, that's exactly what Hanuman is someone much more enlightened is beyond. So I bet you didn't know in closing that the Chinese legend of the Monkey King originated in legends of Hanuman, which were traded between Indian and Chinese um, traders. Um, and that's why, if you've ever wondered, the book about the Monkey King in China is called A Journey to the West, because what is the land exactly that is west of China, except, of course, India? So that will conclude this live stream, and I will just go ahead and check the comments if there are any exactly that is west of China. Okay, flowers of love, some <laughs> pronunciations, but well, I don't know about that. I, I know that uh, I have a lot to learn. Okay, and there's the uh, house lizards making a bunch of noise. Uh, welcome to India. Um, um, I have a lot to learn because the amount of Sanskrit and Hindi that I've studied is basically nothing. It's basically zero. And, you know, obviously one long-term goal of my life is to know something about both languages, especially someone living in India. But uh, I will fully acknowledge that this is a subject I have never fully studied. Um, I have never formally studied at all. Um, but uh, everyone uh, check out Flower's channel. He's uh, teaching, uh, you know, uh, people like, uh, you know, me who's interested in learning something like Sanskrit. He's put up some great videos for all of us to, to learn. So go ahead and check that out. And uh, once again, um, tomorrow, Anti-Tech Revolution by Ted Kaczynski. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching.